Okay, good. So uh, I'm glad we got a chance to, to flush, or flush out the issues about why does the Supreme Court play this role? But then let's turn to the second one, the, the uh, point of some of the readings I assigned you, which was how would you interpret the Constitution then? Right, so you have, <clears throat> would someone care to describe what Justice Scalia's uh, argument was for how we should interpret the Constitution. Um, yeah. did, 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 actually, did, I, did you get the readings for? Yeah, you did, okay. I hope you read Scalia. He's such a you know, wonderful writer. You know. Uh, yes, go ahead. What did Scalia say? You don't have to, why don't you say who you are? You don't have to say you're Justice Scalia. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Caleb. I go to Colorado College. Uh, Justice Scalia, argued for an original public meaning originalism uh, as opposed to uh, original intent originalism, uh, which can have some, may be vulnerable to some criticisms. Original public meaning originalism is uh, interpreting the Constitution uh, by what the words on the page meant to a reasonable observer in the public at the time that the language was ratified. So it played out for me, if you were, you had a second, the first Second Amendment case before you, the first Second Amendment case before you. So you have a, you know, the DC case or the Chicago case and the question is, does the language of the Second Amendment, right, the right of the people uh, to bear arms, is that an individual right to have a gun? How would you do original public meaning interpretation? Hello. So uh, th this is what, what you would have to do is, is do some research uh, that would be uh, extra legal um, in, in some way to. And we know the justices don't do that. So they hire four young law clerks to do it for them, right. like me. <laughs> it's, amazing. it's an amazing job. I hope you all apply for it. You can, you, these are jobs that are reserved for people who are 25 to tw 30 years old. There's four per each justice. And you do all the, you research anything they want you to, and you help them draft opinions. It's, it's like they took kids out of medical school and had them start brain surgery right away. I'm shocked, actually, that the legal profession allows this to go on, but it's great if you're 26 years old. Yeah. So you do some research. What are you looking for? Well, essentially, you're, you're trying to determine as a matter of historical fact uh, what a, a common, reasonable person at the time of the ratification would have thought that the language meant um, you know, a well-regulated well militia being necessary. We, we get that. Um, does, is it assumed or implied? Uh, is, it, is it just so uh, manifestly obvious that that requires an individual uh, you know, right to own a gun for the sake of a militia? Um, that would be the argument that I personally would Good. follow. So Justice Scalia would say, what would a reasonable person at the time of the founding of the Constitution and the enactment of the Second Amendment as part of the Bill of Rights, what would they have thought that language meant and fairly included? Right? Would, it, would this language, not just the right of the people to bear arms, but also the right to have a well-regulated militia, would they have thought they gave you an individual right to bear a, to have a firearm contrary to the laws of a city or a state, right? What would a textual, so Scalia is arguing against people who call themselves sometimes textualists. Sometimes Scalia is called a textualist, but he's not really, he is an originalist. Someone who's a textualist would say, let's look at the words of the amendment and interpret them now. Would someone like to, uh, set out what someone approaching a textualist approach would say about the Second Amendment, right? They wouldn't be swayed by what did people in 1791 think the Second Amendment words. I mean, they would say, what do these words mean now? What, would, what do you think these words mean to you uh, now? And someone who hasn't spoken up here in the front, right here. Hi, my name is Sri. Um from the University of Southern California, thank uh -huh. you. Um, Am I right about the marijuana all over? Yes, yeah. so you look at your face. <laughs> oh, not that I would ever smoke it, but I smell it around. Um, 
They would argue that uh, the Constitution refers only to a well-regulated militia. And so what does that mean? Good. So he says, right, if you look at the text of the Second Amendment, it doesn't just say the people get to have guns. It says, right, the right to bear arms and the right to have a well-regulated militia. What does that mean? Right. So in your view? Um, a group of able-bodied men on behalf of the government um, carrying out state functions of force, um, and that that differs from personal possession of firearms in the context of you know the case that we read, for example. Right. So right. Good. So uh, in your reading, the text just only refers to a militia. It doesn't talk about individual right to bear arms, or the right of the people, right, all of us to bear arms. And they say through the militia. Are there militias running around right now? Thank God, no. What is the modern equivalent of the militia today, would you say? Uh, the military. Yeah, the National Guard, right? The National Guard is a state, right? And then at times they are federalized where they join the US Army, but the National Guard is actually today's version of the state militia. And so then if the state says, oh, you shouldn't have uh, AR-15s, right? Assault weapons, assault rifles, I'm, uh, apparently, then uh, the state can ban them because it's regulating the militia. Right? Good, very good. That's the, that's the argument Scalia is arguing against, saying, no, no, it's not just the text. It is also the understanding of that text in terms of the 18th century. But she makes a very powerful argument, don't you think? She says, I don't see any individuals mentioned in the Second Amendment. I see the right to bear arms through the militia. So where does this right to bear arms come from? Where's the right to have a gun in your house come from? So what does, uh, in the actual opinion, right, implementing this approach, what does Scalia say? Yes, right there. Scalia appeals. I think you're very tall. You don't want to stand, but you should. I was right, <laughs> as always. <laughs> My name is Josh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Scalia in the case we read appeals to the fact that it's codifying a pre-existing right, uh -huh. that it references that people had a right to bear arms and defend themselves in 1791 and previous to the codifying the Constitution, and it's this pre-existing right which he's drawing on. Good. So who's making up the unenumerated right here? Scalia, right? You know, if you, if you read the press about, oh, liberals and conservatives, they say, oh, liberals like to read new kinds of rights out of the Constitution. Conservatives are very upset about this and want to stop them. Who created a new right here that's not in the text of the Constitution? Scalia. And what was exactly, what is that right exactly again? Because it's not in the text, right? But what is that right that you're saying Scalia says has to be there even before the Constitution got written? The right itself is just the right to defend oneself with arms. And where did that right come from? If you believe with the person behind you, that's a historical inquiry. Where did that come from? It comes from British common law, right? Yeah. You have British common law, philosophy, law, Hobbes, all those people from England we try to get away from when we had a revolution, right? But very good. So Scalia says there's this right to self-defense, right, to defend yourself. Uh, that pre-exists the Constitution. Now, what do you, could the state take it away? Right, so that's essentially what the case asks about. Could the state claim, as she just did, as part of the right to create and regulate the militia, we're gonna take away some of those weapons from you because we don't think, we think the harm from having them around outweighs the safety of you being armed to defend yourself. To speak in the terms that I think Justice Scalia would, yeah. the state has the right if they make a constitutional amendment Mm -hmm. to the Second Amendment, but as it's written, the implied rights of the time means you cannot limit the ability to have a gun in general. You can limit, you know, with background checks and other things, but you cannot straight remove the ability without a constitutional amendment. Good. This is an interesting question, actually. I'm not sure. I think you're right, Scalia would say, if you really want to take away this right to self-defense with weapons, you would have to amend the Constitution. But if it's a pre-existing natural right that comes from us from social contract theory, you know, all this stuff that no one really believes in, but we have to study it in school, right? The veil of ignorance and all these other things. They would say maybe you couldn't actually ever take it away, right? That the constitutional text cannot violate these sort of core, right? This is, uh, who else faced this problem in our history? Abraham Lincoln, 
Right? He makes these, he wrestles with these exact same questions about, uh, and just sort of way of bringing it around to the first question, Lincoln had to answer the question, would he obey Dred Scott? Right? Dred Scott said slaves could never be citizens, that Congress could not prohibit the movement of slaves throughout the country, there, there really could not be freed slaves. You know, this is, and Lincoln believed this was utterly wrong. Right? He, he said repeatedly, you know, slavery is a great offense to natural law. He also said this was just a misreading of the Constitution, and Lincoln had to wrestle with this question. Could the law of the Constitution, written text, override natural rights or natural law? Um, he was very cagey about this. But he also said, this is interesting, does anyone know what Lincoln's uh, solution to this problem was with Dred Scott? So it's very funny, he said, I will enforce the Dred Scott case, you know, the decision Dred Scott loses, his former owner wins, but I will not enforce it to any other case. So for the other millions of freed slaves, if the Supreme Court wants to make me send them back to slavery, there's gonna to have to be an individual case at the Supreme Court for every single slave. Make, and effectively saying it would be impossible. Right? Because there's no, you're not gonna have millions and millions of cases in the courts. But he, you know, he, because he morally believed it wrong, he said, then you force me and make me do it one by one, gun by gun, as it were, today. Good, so what does Justice, so Justice Stevens, Right, who's, right, this is a five to four case, it's very close. Justice Stevens, one of the great liberal justices of the last half century, he responds to Justice Scalia. What does he say? So the party makes the textual argument right, that the Second Amendment comes through the militia. What else does Justice Stevens say in favor of the state's right to have broader gun control? Everybody skipped his opinion, eh? Usually a good idea. <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, uh, Justice Stevens, uh, I, I think actually Justice Stevens has the better of the argument, but Justice Scalia got more votes. Uh, so Stevens, but, uh, but anyone hasn't spoken yet? Otherwise, yeah, go right here. He started us off. Huh? What is Justice Stevens' response? Justin Stevens basically says that states do have some leeway of experimenting, and in fact, the problem of guns in the case of DC, there was a significant public interest, lives were at stake, and states should have general leeway unless they were you know, harming minorities, harming people that didn't have a political voice in the system to try having this law to reduce gun violence in this, does District. Justice Stevens take issue with the use of history? I don't think he does. Right, in fact, Stevens produces a lot of his own history, right? He does even more research. And he says, I can show you that her reading of the text was the correct understanding, even back then, that you saw a lot of regulation by states of guns, right? The, he, he has examples where states said, these are the only kinds of guns you should bring when we call you out for the militia. And they have to be in this condition, and so on and so forth. Effectively, Stephen says, isn't that gun control right? through the militia? Right? Doesn't really address this interesting argument about the pre-existing natural right of self-defense, though. But Stevens, right, he, this is the reason I, this is such a great case is the political positions and judicial positions kind of reverse. Stephen says, Where'd you get this right of self-defense from? Where does it come from? Nobody voted on it, right? It's not in the text. I don't think it's there. I only see the text of the Second Amendment and it shows a historical practice of very extensive state regulation of firearms. And then if he had gone farther, he would have said that it's really the 20th century where we see this idea of the individual right to bear arms become an important idea. And he could have said in the 18th and 19th century, people didn't even talk about it very much. There's no case at the Supreme Court that squarely presents the individual right to bear arms question until 2000s. For two, over 200 years, no one even took the trouble to litigate cases about guns. So it's very interesting. Um, and then Stephen makes this other pitch, which uh, I think is sort of implicit in your discussion about why the powers are separated. This is an important discussion about federalism he throws in there. 
this is a hard problem. Why not let the states experiment and see what a good approach to gun control might be?